Uh, I will add some more details about myself that have, have to do with the uh, with my way of life and what you're going to see. Uh, I was born in 1944, uh, the end of the World War in Slovakia. I uh, made Aliyah at uh, 49 with mother. Uh, I'm married to uh, Giora Rome, who retired as a major general in the Israeli Air Force. Um, something that defined a very, a very volatile life. In our first 28 years of marriage, we moved 15 different places, mm -hmm. uh, among, uh, among other uh, two abroad. Um, and uh, as you heard my CV, I adapted myself always to the place we went. I never expected nothing to be adapted to me, so I studied very different uh, fields. And uh, taking my personality and the way of life, it was uh, kind of uh, very helpful, and probably God blessed me with it. Uh, a sort of, it helped me to uh, to strengthen my um, uh, system of protection. So um, I ran, I ran, I ran. I worked, and uh, at 2000, uh, before uh, uh, 2000, the year 2000, I, I worked in high tech. Uh, I'm a com computer wise since uh, the first computers uh, emerged. And uh, then, as you know, everything blew out, and it was a good time to think, to stop. It was the first time in my life that I had the time to stop and think. And then I decided that something is very wrong, that I know nothing about my father, my children know nothing about their grandfather, and I know nothing about my grandparents. So I decided to quit everything and to start a search. Uh, but as you heard, uh, the story, my story starts um, at, the age of, uh, at the age of eight. Uh, I was very happy. It was 1952. Uh, we were uh, the family lamb, what you would say today, a normative family. Uh, I was a very happy child, and, uh, and then my sister Nava was born. Okay. <laughs> so, uh, everybody of us probably uh, ex experienced this exile from the paradise of innocence, and I want to tell you about my experience. Uh, Nava was crying, it was Saturday, um, it was autumn. Uh, we lived in Gottlieb Street, which is next to today's Ben Gurion, then it was Karen Payne Street, Boulevard in fact. And uh, mother and uh, father asked me to take the little baby, uh, I was eight years older, almost eight, and to take her to the boulevard, to Karen Payne. Um, and uh, I did so, I took her, we were sitting on a bench and uh, she stopped crying, she was very nice and quiet and then I saw two ladies approaching me. Uh, one of them, I knew she was the the seamstress. Difficult to wear, seamstress, and she even uh, uh, did for me some robe that I hated, and uh, somehow I felt bad about these two ladies and the approaching me. But uh, then they came, and uh, that was the scene. Uh, the two women, still arm in arm, walk over to the stroller. What's your sister name? The seamstress asked me. I don't feel like telling her. I have an urge to let out foot 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 through my teeth like my mother does to ward off the heavy eye. But to my surprise, the seamstress isn't interested in hearing an answer. She grasps her friend's arm in the tight clasp 
of, of a jail warden and they turn away. But not before the seamstress lets out a crushing declaration in Polish. Well, Rosa, you probably know the girl and the baby aren't from the same father. Now, we speak about the 50s. As you know, in the 50s, no internet, hardly encyclopedia, and a child of eight <coughs> really doesn't know how children come to the world and doesn't know all the biology. Maybe even not when he's 17 at that time. <laughs> uh, so I heard what she said and I understood, my, I understood it was something very bad and I need to know what does it mean. Well, it took me a while. I, we had the Encyclopedia Hebrew at home, the Hebrew Encyclopedia, and I started to browse. I understood that today you meet Father and Mother. Anyway, I discovered the, the biology, and then I, I, had, I understood that Nava, that Tonio, my father of these days, is Nava's more than mine, and probably I had a different father. But how do I find? So I started to look all over the places at home, and I remember that father had a drawer. So I found a, a, in the drawer, I found the adoption certificate, and it was written that my father, Moshe Dreyover, was killed by the Nazis. Just to, to let you know that even in those years, uh, the Holocaust was a taboo. No one talked. People had to survive, and no one until the Eichmann uh, trial, Shoah, and everything that was in Europe was a taboo. Not at school, anywhere. They hardly did talk about it. So now I see suddenly I'm eight years old, I see Nazi, I see I, I'm starting to explore also more about the Holocaust, about the Nazis, and uh, I understand that my father uh, was killed. Now, interestingly enough, at that time, just by chance, I read the book of, um, uh, of Lucy Montgomery, uh, Anne, Green, uh, Anne of Green Gables, which is today her Sufit. It is today a bestseller, it was rewritten. And I said to myself, well, if they, read, if they wrote a book about Anne, she was an orphan, maybe they will write a book about myself one day as well. So anyway, uh, I, uh, I took my father as something very amorphic, but I, was, I started to be very attached to him, and he was uh, my, my guardian angel from that day on. And the uh, time flies and uh, went on and went on and as I told you I was very busy bee and life wasn't easy with, with our way of life. And I already, I was 40, I already had uh, three children and when I approached my 40th birthday no one did talk ever at home about anything and then I said okay I'm 40, almost 40, my mother, many years are since the Holocaust, past, since the, it, it past, since the Holocaust, and so I think that, that she will be able to tell me and I need to know who was my father and what happened to him. So uh, we lived at that time in the Negev, in Ramon Air Base, my husband was the base commander commander of the air base, and, and um, uh, Ben Gurion said that the openness of the desert really brings a lot of uh, uh, advantage to the human being, and it's so all, it leaves calm, and really, I was a student then, and I felt very uh, easy, I called my mother, and uh, I told her uh, uh, if she remembers that I have birthday in a week. So she said, sure I know, sure I remember that you have a birthday. And, uh, and uh, uh, so I told her, I'm coming. So she said, ah, I'm coming for lunch, I prepare everything you love. Da -tum, da -tum. And then as every year, she asked her, what do you want as a present mm -hmm. for your birthday? So then there, that's all there. Yes, mother, that time 
I have to have a special request. I want to talk about my father. The words are clear. The words are clear, but she, but did she notice the tremor in my voice? An alarming silence from the other end of the line. Is she all right? Has she fainted? Time stands still, but it seems she has managed to regain her com com composure. All right, I will find everything I can before you come. She answers quietly. What is there to find, I wonder, while my curiosity and tension were well up? Well, um, it was a very moving meeting. Um, I came and uh, in the hall of Gottlieb 17, I mean, uh, nothing has been changing uh, since I was in my childhood. And I see on the table um, that mother prepared some photo album and uh, there was a small uh, box for jewelry and so on and so forth. And, uh, and then she apologized and said uh, that, that I won't be disappointed because she doesn't know very much. And the reason she said it is that she met my father in the ghetto Bosnia, and uh, it was 1943. Uh, his family at that stage already was taken, perished in fact. Uh, some in Belzec and some were shot. Uh, it is uh, two sisters and parents and uh, niece and uh, they were shot. Uh, so people didn't talk about the family because uh, they need to survive and they need, they need to protect themselves. So, uh, and then, uh, as you will see, uh, a year and a half later, my father disappeared I mean, in the Holocaust. So she really knew, she was very young, she was 18 then, uh, and she knew very, very little. So she told me what she knew. She told me about Ghetto Bochnia. Uh, she, she didn't know the names of his parents because he didn't talk about them and she couldn't recall. And nor of his sisters. Uh, since you are in genealogy, so I have some uh, family trees and I go very fast. If you want me to stop someone, just please tell me. She told me uh, how, how they escaped to Slovakia, as I told you I was born in Slovakia. So, uh, so that's Bohemia. Uh, uh, my mother uh, escaped through the Kopane and came here to, uh, I was born in Lubela, but uh, here is the Topsky Nikolaj, next to Lubela, it's a big city. Lubela is a small town, small village, very small village. And my father from Bosnia escaped to Presho. Uh, later on, they met in Presho. They met in Presho. They married in the in Presho in the in the synagogue of Presho. And they escaped. I go back here. They escaped uh, to uh, to Budapest. Because uh, in Slovakia in uh, 19, uh, 1943, uh, it was very tough for the Jewish people. At that time, still in, in, uh, in Hungary, it was much, much more tolerant. But when they came to Budapest, the quota for Jews was uh, over, and they had to escape to Debrecen. Uh, in Debrecen, my mother uh, found out she's pregnant. <coughs> Uh, and uh, just to let you know, they got married in November 30th, 43. I was born in November 30th, 44. Exactly, Kaed Chaya, like in the Bible, the same day, a year later, I was born. Uh, so uh, they escaped to Debrecen, and then they want to go back to, uh, to Mikulash because they had friends there, and my mother, her sister, was here. Uh, but on the border of, between Slovakia and Hungary, in uh, uh, Chateau Rhine, uh, my uh, father was taken. Uh, he was in prison for a while, and then he was taken uh, away. And in fact, he disappeared. 
that's a, uh, that's a scenery of the era because uh, that's a toxicula schlumpella is here and uh, after my father was taken and my mother came to Mikulash, the, the situation of the Jews was terrible and she, had, she was hiding in, in those uh, mountains, in the caves. There are caves and they were hiding there and when she uh, had to deliver, uh, uh, one, uh, one partisan found a family in Lubella, uh, the Copeland family as you can see that's the Coffin family that agreed to hide us and that I will, that mother will give birth in their house. They were Christian and uh, Catholics. Uh, also mother gave me some photos of my father and uh, I saw he's a very nice, charming, he was a nice, charming guy. Uh, and, and she gave me the wedding ring, which by the way, uh, like a year ago, was stolen with other jewelry from my own. And it was very, very sad to me. Yes. Uh, and, um, and she gave me also photos of uh, his niece, that at the time, as I told you, wasn't with, with us anymore. And this is his mother, his niece, and one of his sisters. Mother knew that he had, he had one sister. Uh, she told me about our assumed identity. Uh, my father's assumed name was uh, Marian Galevsky, uh, and, uh, and I was born as Maria Galevska. This is my birth certificate, uh, and uh, this is mother and I uh, in Slovakia. She told me also about her family, the Haber. She comes, her maiden name was Haber, and I won't go into it, but uh, it's as tragic as can be. Also, nobody survived except her sister. So, my father now, uh, Monie, his nickname, uh, materialized, and I could see his face, and uh, I was very happy with it, and uh, I felt much better. Again, time flies, I did nothing with it. I was wondering if I should tell my children or I shouldn't tell my children the same, the same uh, uh, ritual goes again, not telling, yes telling, but I, I told them much later when they were much more grown up. Uh, except my daughter, uh, that uh, she is elder than the boys and uh, I told her earlier. So uh, uh, in 1993, my husband uh, became defense attaché in Washington, uh, D.C., the uh, Israeli defense attaché, and we moved to D.C. In this year, uh, uh, in 1993, they opened the Holocaust Museum, and it was the first museum in the world that had an interactive system that you could search, at that time Yad Vashem didn't have it yet, that you could search data and you could uh, do many uh, 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 cross uh, yeah, yeah. And uh, I, I hardly knew how to spell Gryover because uh, in America it's Drajower and I called mother, I asked her how to spell it. And so uh, I started to search, and to make the long story short, I found in Philadelphia a lady uh, called uh, Frida Ryover Hoffman after marriage. This is the original paper that I wrote. <coughs> I had to leave for them to contact her because you cannot contact directly. And uh, she was the first person to introduce me to the Ryover tribe. She told me that the, uh, the family name comes from Grajevo, here is Grajevo, and in the uh, 19th century they moved to a Krakow uh, era, uh, area and they spread the channel of Chibinia uh, around Krakow. Uh, she drew me a little uh, draft of, uh, of the family tree 
and she could tell that the head of the of most of the tribe of Graiofer was a person called Moshe Israel Graiofer, that I call him M I G the first. And, and, uh, and he had ten children, she didn't recall all of them, but he was um, responsible of many, many drivers I had. Um, so I started to search in the internet in, this, in those years, already the internet uh, for genealogy became very, very helpful, uh, really a great tool. And I found a, a photo of the tomb of a uh, stone, stone uh, of Moshe Israel there in Krakow and uh, in the place where his, uh, it was located. And I could find more children and, and Drew, who his wife was Tamara Shamro, and I could uh, continue and uh, uh, learning about the family. So as I told you, the internet become, became very uh, instrumental and uh, I started uh, to spread uh, the word the time uh, Maria Belevska, my assumed name, and I'm looking for my father whose name was Moshe Graiover, but his assumed name was Maria Belevska. So I met some people that were interested in the case and started to help me very much. Um, and Eva Polsch, maybe somebody of you know the name Eva Florsheim or Julian Shamrock. And Eva Florsheim uh, joined me in my first trip to Europe, to Poland. Um, and she also introduced me to many uh, ways of uh, data in uh, Yad Vashem. At that stage, I was very, very nervous I would say, that would be the right way to do it, to, to, uh, that, I, that I don't know the name of my grandparents because that pre prevented me of, of really finding answers because if I don't know the grandparents' name, so how can I really do a family tree? Or a so my mother has a sister, as I told you, Bronca. She is Lonka and her sister is Bronca. This is Bronca, this is Lonka, this is me in Slovakia. And I was Bronca is in Israel as my mother. And, uh, and I asked her how you knew Monyet before mother knew him. You knew his parents. Can't you recall the name of She said, I don't recall. And then she tells me, listen, I know one thing. First of all, your grandfather was religious, he had a verb, and, and I know somewhere in the back of, back of my mind, I remember they had a business that had to do with feathers. So I see already there, uh, there is this uh, Polish family uh, in Tel Aviv that they have all the Puch business, uh, what's the name, I don't remember now, Free, video Free. So I said, okay, that was their business feathers, probably, and uh, you already can put at that stage, you could uh, look into business directories, especially of a city like Krakow. I knew that father was from Krakow. And I was going, and then finally, in 19, 1929 directory, I found out uh, David Graiover, Pure Astushi, uh, and the address. I called my aunt and I asked her if it's possible that my grandfather's name was David, David. There was quiet, like was my conversation with my mother many years ago. And then she said, yes, I'm sure it was David. So now it was really, as I wrote here, the pivotal point, because once I find out David and the Pura, the, the feathers uh, business, I really could go on. It was very helpful. Well, in Yad Vashem there were other uh, really uh, amazing papers and documents that I could learn more about uh, the family, even about them. Uh, and, um, and here started uh, really uh, the mystery. Uh, you know all what is the ITS, the International Tracing Service. Uh, they open it now uh, in Germany, uh, in uh, Bad Aarhusen. 
so anyway, there are these microfilms in Yad Vashem since ever. And I started to look for Gryover. And then, uh, interestingly enough, I found a, a Hedvika Gryover, daughter of Moshe and uh, Leah, and a certain address in Slovakia, in Mikulash. And then I go on, that was H, letter H, Hedvika. And then I reach the letter L, my mother, Lonka or Leah, and then I see Lonka in the same address. So I said, but who is Hedvika? I, I am not Hedvika, so who is this Hedvika? And I thought maybe I had a twin, because she was her birthday is my birthday. So I didn't know, and I, I came home, no one knows who is Hedvika, and I don't know anything. And I became very, very confused. And then also, I found a lot of documents about Gryover, and there was one M. Gryover, uh, but I really couldn't cross anything and it was when I came home I asked my aunt and my mother about Hedvika and I asked about uh, uh, if it's possible that my father was in the camps and uh, so my mother told me listen but if it's uh, uh, in 44 well, you should look after Gajewski and not Gryover because he had assume uh, uh, identity and assume uh, certificates and uh, so false uh, certificate on the name Marian Bielski. So I went back uh, to the Yad Vashem and then I see that Marian Bielski is really a name like Smith, like John Smith. I mean, every second there are hundreds of Marian Bielski. So I really cannot follow. Uh, and, uh, and it stopped and then I found photos at Yad Vashem, later on I found out why they were there, and this is my father as a, a Jewish policeman, uh, and many other photos. This is my aunt in uh, Bohnia, ghetto Bohnia, and, uh, and uh, uh, my curiosity is going on and on, and I really uh, decide that my only chance is to go to Poland and Slovakia. So that's what I do. And uh, and here, as I said, what happened to me is like Alice in the one world, one world, world, world land. And I really am in the rabbit hole and now I'm, I lost control. Um, here, this photo is in the archive in uh, the archive in Krakow. This is uh, on the uh, this is Lubella in the background, you understand me? It was very tough. They didn't want to give me uh, my father's birth certificate because according to the Polish law, after their experience in the First World War, uh, they don't give any data uh, unless you have a proof of first blood relation. But I didn't have any proof. Uh, I have a, on my birth certificate, it's Gajewska. I mean, I didn't have any paper that related me to my father, Moshe Gryover. So they didn't want to give me anything, but with my Polish and with being a little bit rude, finally, they gave me his birth certificate. And, and as you can see, uh, I find out that his name is Moshe Israel. His first name is Moshe Israel and last name Gryover. And his parents, David Gryver, and his mother, Rita, uh, made the name Mohammed. So, uh, as soon as I saw that his name was Moshe Israel Gryover, my mission became much larger because I decided that I'm not going to live until I don't find that, that Moshe Israel Gryover, the first, as I told you, was his great grandfather. So then I will be really, I will be the, the family. So uh, I was very moved when I got his uh, birth certificate and, uh, and now I could draw this, uh, this tree, this name, uh, I mean, uh, no, uh, David Gryver, Richard Gryver, and, uh, and then I go and in the census of 1921st, uh, I find out that he didn't have one sister, he had two sisters. 
So if he had two sisters, how do I know who was the, the mother of the girl that we saw and how can I find the name of the girl? And as, as, as I go, I find more a challenge and more become difficult and more moving and so on and so on. So um, uh, now, if you if uh, you had this experience, so the birth certificate records uh, in Poland are not alphabetical; they go in according to the years. Every year has a huge, huge book. Uh, each side of the book is like this table, so when you open it, it's double. I mean, it's a kind of album, like half the table closed, and when you open, it's double. So I didn't know the age of the girl, but I assumed that she was born between uh, 1934 and 1937. I couldn't really tell exactly her age. So they brought four books, this side, and we were four people sitting, on the floor and looking to find ma mother maiden name Gryover that gave birth within this year. And then suddenly one of us find out the girl name is Bella and her mother, her father is Abraham Rosendler and he, her mother is a, a Esther Gryover. Yes, is her, her mother is Esther Gryover. So I know that Esther is the mother of Bella, married to Abraham Rosendler, and her sister is Frederica Granville. So there were three children, Moshe, Fred uh, Esther was the eldest, uh, Frederica was the second, and they both were born before the First World War, and Moshe, my father, was born in 1919, uh, immediately after the First World War. So he's in the world, no children, before and after. So uh, now I know that the lovely, lovely girl unfortunately killed is Bella Rosendler. Uh, I gave all the name to Yad Vashem, I mean, because those people, as, as you can understand, they didn't have a, any record. They disappeared in the world, and until I researched them, no one knew they existed in them. So they were, didn't have that anything. <coughs> they were not listed anywhere. So I did it all, but much more. So now I, I, I have a better uh, family tree, and now I need to go, how do I decide, do I find the, the relation with Moshe Israel? So I find out this certificate, this certificate of, this is my grandfather David here, and, and I found that his father was Jacob and his mother was Rukla. So now I assume that, that Jacob <coughs> was the son of Moshe Israel Raiova. But I, I need to find it and it was very, very complicated. Hmm? It's, I, I don't know, but see all the family in 1936 uh, asked for certificate, we assumed that they were, and somebody also confirmed it, that they were looking to do a liyab. But uh, I found other documents that they had problem in the business, so probably they didn't do it. But, but since everybody got a certificate, this is a Stera. This is Stera, and my father also, I found all this, and also I found of their mother from the same year, so I don't know. But, uh, but at least I found this information. Then I could discover many other members of the family, cousins and niece and so on, uh, due to a very, very uh, bad story that somebody, some, Sarah Dreyover, that's amazing, it happened probably very often during the Holocaust and after. Sarah Gryover, she was a uh, Schindler List on Schindler List, and she survived the Holocaust. She came afterward with a list of all members of the family to search for them. 25 members of the family she was looking for, and some lawyer, 55 years old then, took this list and he took all the properties and everything of all the family. 
So I met Sarah, she still, she still lives in Australia, very cool lady, very sad, I'll show you later her but, but like that I could really already elaborate all three except that I don't have the connection of Yaakov and the club to their ancestors, but I will. And so Sarah, Sonia Sarah and myself are the only survivors from all this tribe, all perished. Well, I'm making it short, but it, it was come and go and it took a long time till somebody found for me the wheel of Moshe Israel Driver, the original wheel. And in the original wheel of Moshe Israel Driver, he lists his sons. <coughs> and the second son is Yaakov. Yaakov, and here is his age, he was 57 then, Yaakov. So then I could link uh, my father, grandfather to his great grandfather, and I knew that my father was named after Moshe Israel. I had the proof that he was named after his great grandfather. And it was. Uh, where, where did you find the will? Uh, in uh, Brodska, Brodska archive in Krakow. It's, a, it's an archive that deals with legislative, more stuff, mm -hmm. uh, you know, all kind of business contracts. Like, yeah. And it's so open like that, it's anybody open. can go. Yes, to. yes, it's incredible. It's incredible. Mm -hmm. You'll see soon else what I found there. Okay, so uh, now I was very happy, but still I have the enigma of Mariam Bajewski and really about the fate of, what was the fate of my father. So, as I told you, it was very tough because there were so many Marian Kajewski. But in the same archive in Grotska, and I really recommend if somebody of you is in Krakow to go there because it's really I find a file of my mother, Lea Haber Graveo, in which a manga, it's a big file, she claims to recognize her as a widow. Uh, which probably is very important. I mean, uh, at that time they didn't know that, uh, that widows of the Holocaust will have a special, uh, a special uh, treatment. But a, a, a Jewish woman that doesn't have a proof of a widow, she really is, uh, has a problem. So I found uh, letters from lawyers and two lawyers, uh, all correspondence of my mother, and among other, she tells, and then she was still fresh, it was 48, the paper is from 48, here, 26, <coughs> 48. So she claims that my father uh, escaped from the train to Auschwitz and was taken to a prison in Zakopane. Well, as everything happened, as I told you, I'm in the rabbit hole still, and then I find out, Eva, in fact, told me about a book called a uh, palace uh, Katownia Podhala. Podhal is the region in which the Kopane is and Katownia is a slaughterhouse. So uh, in Zakopane and there is a museum there, I was there, there was a, a, pala, a palace, it was a recreation place that the Nazis turned it into a prison, very cruel prison, small prison, to polit in which they uh, put the political uh, uh, prisoner. In the book, I will read you the uh, line. As I flip through the pages, I discover on page 96 a photograph of the wall in cell number five, where someone had written Marian Gajewski 9.29.44. I feel dizzy. I close my eyes tightly and open them again. Late September 1944, all the Marian Gajewskis I found had disappeared between June and October 1944 without certain proof of death. Maybe this one, who had engraved his name with bleeding nails onto the wall, was my Marian Gajewski. Or is this common name playing tricks on my mind? Did did the forgers use, the na use a name as common, as banal as John Smith? 
With trembling hands, I flip back to the list of names at the end of the book, where I discover a chilling, laconic sentence. The fate of Marian Bielewski is unknown, because most of them listed in the book, they tell he was killed like that, he was killed like that, he was... Marian Bielewski is unknown. So, uh, I, I write to the Red Cross, I have big correspondence, they were very helpful with the Red Cross, they found from me Gayevsky here and Gayevsky there, and, uh, and it still stayed as an enigma, I couldn't really tell. So uh, I go uh, to Mikulash and to Lubela. By the way, uh, my nickname where I came to, when I came to Israel was Gaga. Now, uh, I hate it. Kids were laughing with me, are you a duck, are you gaga gaga? And here is my country with the silver, with the name Gaga, it's difficult to see here. But that was my name when I came to Israel, I never knew why. I asked my mother then, she said, I don't know, you mixed letters, she never gave me an answer. Okay. So I came to Mikulash and, uh, and my mother, when before I left to Poland, she was very very stressed. And she wouldn't never go back to Poland and she was sure I'm going to be killed. I mean, the murderer and she never went back. And she, but she still gave me two names from Mikulash. One is the Kochlan, the name of Kochlan, the family that I was born in the house. And the other name was Bernitsky. Uh, Bernitsky was a Catholic family in, uh, from which we rented a, a, an apartment uh, after the war before we left Slovakia. So I uh, called, uh, I, I located with the help of uh, the girl from the hotel, I located uh, Bernitsky. He came and he asked me, uh, did you see Joseph Jutsovic? So I said, no, I don't know the name. So he said, come, I'm taking you. I was with Eva Floshan. He took us to this man. By the way, he doesn't live anymore, and his wife, Alicia, doesn't live anymore. They died a few years ago. And I'm coming. He hugs me. He was a, a, a big man, a short, very fat man. He hugs me very, very strong. And, and the first thing he asks me is, he calls me Gaga, and he asks, do you know why, why you were called Gaga? I was shocked. I said, in the age, I'm almost 60, I have to go to Slovakia to a small place to hear why I was, said no. So I'll tell you now uh, why I was named Gaga. A nice story. Uh, when I was uh, when I was uh, hardly a month years old, it was almost Christmas. It was I was born in November 30th. It was mid December. I was very very ill. I wouldn't eat, and uh, and uh, my uh, my stomach was very very swollen. Um, today they call it the Pashuta Me'ayim. It was, I mean, I had in the yeah, yeah. Uh, some, but then it was the war, no, no doctors, nothing, and in fact, uh, I was going to die. So uh, all the small village of Lubella were very sad, and uh, on the 15th day of her life. The bitter news spread through the town. There was no hope for baby Maria. The priest and his, and his follower decided the baby must be baptized so that she may join the Son of God according to the customary belief of the Christian faith. The morning was cold, snowy and bright. The bell of the white church on the hill of the neighboring village clutching told nine times. A small melancholy procession left, left the Copeland's houses. The priest stood waiting at the church entrance, dressed with his most festive robe and wearing a high triangular hat on his head. 
He turned into the church and everyone followed him along the red carpet that led to the platform with the figure of the crucified Savior behind. Lonka and the dying baby were invited up to the altar along with the baby's godfather, Andreas Kaufmann. The priest took baby Maria from her mother's arms and gently placed her on the altar's white lace cover. The ceremony had begun. As the priest repeated the ritual a third time, uh, the ritual I hereby baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Uh, an unmistakable sound was suddenly heard from the direction of the altar. The little had been relieved of the load that had burdened her for so many days. The priest immediately understood what had happened. A miracle had occurred. With a great trembling voice, Young un unashamedly announced to the congregation, a great miracle has just taken place, the miracle of resurrection, bestowed by the Virgin Mary before our very eyes. The baby whose name Maria, like our blessed Virgin, has been rescued from the jaws of death and has entered the, the covenant of the Catholic faith. This year, Holy Child will henceforth be named after both saint for whom our Slovak Catholic Church is named, Hedvika Maria. So, in fact, in fact, my first name was Hedvika since, and not, Hedvika, and not Maria, and the nickname for Hedvika is Aga. Now when they would ask me what's my name, I would say Gaga. So that was the Gaga, but my mother never told me what was the Gaga. So, yeah. so here you can see, here you can see my, uh, my baptized uh, certificate, and here is, I mean it's not the original, this is the original, this is the original, and here is the priest of today, not today, I mean a few years, uh, ten years ago, writing for me the, the, the Catholic, my Catholic uh, identity. So uh, uh, then I go, this is, this is Anastasia Copeland, the daughter of uh, the Copeland who died already, but she is almost the age of my mother and she remembers every day. I'm very close to her, I visit her since many, many times, a great lady, really, very cool, very modest, but a, but a very, very nice lady. And this is the, the, the church in Flachany, which is adjacent to Lupin. So that's the Aga. Then, uh, when I go to, to Warsaw, to Jeev, as you know, the Jewish Historical Institute, I meet, uh, has somebody of you meet uh, Anya? Anyway, a great person. She, she keeps the louder archive in the Jewish uh, Historic Institute of Warsaw. And uh, she was looking for me for any uh, papers for the driver. So she found for me their, uh, uh, their uh, uh, license to keep their business during the war until 43. They were allowed to keep their business, and um, and I wonder why. And then um, uh, they dealt with the, uh, the the business was ostrich feathers, uh, so all the ornaments and so on and so forth, and the heads and the shells. Uh, but during the war, there was no import. It was imported from Africa through France and Vienna. And Vienna. But during the war, there was no import, so they transformed their business to, to silk flowers. And if I had goose uh, uh, skin during all my search, that was the most moving, because somehow I was, I was a very Israeli girl. I was in the youth movement, and I would uh, collect stones and sand and uh, everything. But from the age of 16, 
I started to collect silk flowers. Now, in Israel, nobody heard about silk flowers, but I somehow discovered that there are silk flowers, and in the age of 18, I first time before my service, I, I flew to, to the Golden Medina because there was an uncle there uh, from the Haber family and, and where he lived in the hall there was a huge, huge uh, flower arrangement so beautiful and so huge I had never seen and when I approached it, it was silk flower so since then I started to collecting silk flower and then suddenly, and no one knew what, why silk flowers, whatever in my, and then I find out that my family dealt with silk flowers. So I, I have no explanation, but there is some miraculous uh, things about it. I, it wasn't enough for me because I was very frustrated. Okay, I know about my family tree, I know a little bit, I discovered a lot of stories about the family and so on and so forth. But I know nothing about my father's youth, childhood, anything. And then uh, in Irgun Yotzei Krakow in Israel, there was a Hanukkah event, and, and uh, I found out somehow that probably my father was in the Tachemoni school in Krakow. I meet, uh, I go to the person uh, that uh, heads this organization and I ask her if by chance she knows somebody here from the Takmon Takemoni school. So she tells me yes and she introduced me to Mr. Bosak, Yusef Bosak, and, and he looks at me, I'm telling him who I am, I'm the daughter of Moshe Greiber, and he looks, later on he tells me, listen, a crazy woman tells me she looks like, a, I mean he thought that I'm much younger and she tells me she's the daughter of Monique. Anyway, he was the best friend of my father, the best friend. This is Yosef Bostak. I, I will tell you about Dude Greiber. Yosef Bostak lived in Sebastiana, Sebastiana <coughs> 33, uh, Dude Sebastiana 34 and my father in Sebastiana 29. They were best friends. Dudek was a bit younger, but Bosak and my father was the same class. And then, and then uh, Bosak gives me these photographs. It's their class from 1932. And here is my father. This is my father sitting here. He was then 10. And, and then Bostak shows me his certificate, probably for um, to that Zehu, where my father is signed as a witness for his certificate. And, and then I show him, I show him the photos I have, and then he shows me that's me. Here is my signature, Joseph. Joseph, here, probably. So I gave him this photo, he gave me this photo, I mean we made copies for sure, and I couldn't believe it, and he told me all, everything about their childhood, about their families, all kind of anecdotes, and it's really unbelievable. And uh, in fact, this research, what I did, not only had impact for my personal uh, enrichment and, and um, uh, it gave me the feel that, that roots are so important and I could, I could understand all kind of, of attitudes of the people like my mother and my parents' parents, my father's parents that, that, uh, uh, swear, that hate Poland you cannot cut your roots, I mean. Every time you do it, probably you miss a lot. And so I, I started to uh, volunteer and encourage people. Uh, I was lecturing a lot, the book got a lot of reviews, and I really encourage people to research, not to give up, and um, also uh, 
we, uh, I marched in some march, and uh, here I am with the mayor of uh, Bosnia, and uh, with the friends of Bosnia in Israel, I made a big contribution for this uh, memorial, uh, which is in the center of Bosnia. It's really beautiful. <coughs> made by Yalena Pazzi, the sculptor, the Israeli sculpture. She also donated it, uh, the sculpture. And here is a memorial for my family as well. Um, and all kind of, I lecture in high school in Poland. I speak Polish, but very bad. But they can understand me. Uh, I also uh, found a lot in the archive, since I was so much in the head, the good connection with the people in the archive. I found uh, photographs for the Rab Lau that he has never seen from his family, because as you know, he was from Krakow. Uh, and here I give him the photos, uh, and he was very moved by that. This is Sarah Greiber from Australia, that I told you I met her in Sydney. And uh, this is a family from Brazil. And uh, this person and this woman died in the meantime. Uh, I was lucky because of the jobs of my, my husband, I could travel uh, all over the world really and find in Cuba and everywhere, find uh, the people. And uh, so I'm in touch with everyone. Don Greiver is in Roman Ghana, he's 90, he's very young now. Uh, and these are younger. Faye Greiver is from in Boston, she's a very well known artist. If you look in the internet, a very, very successful artist. Um, and, uh, and this is my mother, let her really live to 120. This is my sister and the family. Now the family is born, is grew. This one has two children, and my family is also larger already. I have four grandchildren, uh, two adults, and and then, and everything I told you, but with much more anecdotes and stories really described in my book. And uh, thank you very much.